Okay. Now, is, is this working now? Yeah. Okay. So I did think about having Laura Beth talking over here. Introduce you, Mark. He's a biomedical anthropologist, especially in children, family relationships. So look at that. That to me is just a huge breath of fresh air compared to some of the more recent understandings of how culture works. That was a bit cryptic. I won't name any controversy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mark is really one of the very first evolutionary anthropologists. He looks young, but he actually goes way back. <laughs> With publications in the late 70s and early 80s, and then really just activity um, on an escalating um, schedule since that time. His PhD mentor was Napoleon Chagnon, you may know that he studied the Yanomamo, who wrote the influential book The Fierce People, he got a lot of flack for it, which he has written about in a recent book that I actually highly recommend to all of you, goes by the title The Noble Savage, working off of uh, Rousseau. Um, but anyway, that's a very fascinating book. So that was Mark's PhD mentor. He also interacted a lot with some of you guys may know, Bill Irons. Bill or no, Bill Irons. Okay. At Baylor, um, Mark teaches cultural anthropology, global anthropology, sex, hormones, and behavior, and child and family health and global perspective. So if you're at Baylor, you could take those Mark did his undergraduate year. Um, he was an anthro major, and then he did his PhD um, at, with NAP at uh, Northwestern and Penn State. Graduating ultimately from Northwest. I could go on and on. Laura could add all the juicy parts, but we're just going to end here. <laughs> okay. Thank you. This is the title Runaway Social Selection and Human Evolution. Thank you all. It's wonderful to be.
Thank you, Beverly. That's a most kind introduction. Uh, I was born in Ann Arbor. Uh, I was ready to uh, thank you all for making effort to come and hear my talk on such a gray, gloomy, rainy day. But miracles happen, and here we are on a brilliant sunny day. And so instead, I'm thanking you for coming to a talk when you could otherwise be outside enjoying this fabulous spring weather. Hopefully, it will uh, sustain itself uh, a week from today when we can watch the eclipse, but knock on wood. Um, I have a, a talk that Beverly requested uh, that would review a grand idea of our mentor, Richard Alexander. And uh, this idea has a, a fairly long history, and I'm, I'm not going to go through the details here. But uh, Dick, when he was in Australia, um, became especially interested in uh, writing an explanation for how this unusual species that we are, how humans might have evolved. And uh, he didn't stop writing about that problem. I, it was a big problem. I don't know that we'll ever stop writing about uh, why humans are human, but uh, you know, he certainly put together an amazing uh, trajectory of it. Uh, I'll focus on a paper that he wrote in 1990. And uh, it's a stunning paper uh, in terms of the, the depth and richness of ideas that are contained within it. And uh, to, to give you a, a very brief synopsis, Dick challenged us to try and understand how this process of human evolution might have occurred. And he had this unusual perspective in which uh, he wasn't satisfied focusing in on one of our traits. He's very greedy. Uh, maybe that's not the right word, but very ambitious in trying to put the whole enchilada together. That each and every human characteristic and trait was a valuable piece of the puzzle that needed to be explained. And that any one of them, if it didn't fit with the big picture model, then the model was just another beautiful hypothesis destroyed by data. So he was really challenging his model. He was putting it at great risk uh, to have some bright graduate student come along with uh, a, a piece of the puzzle that didn't fit. So he's looking for a combination of traits, huge brain, complex intellect, Concealed ovulation, menopause, physically helpless but mentally precocial baby. But above all, our tendency and ability to cooperate and compete in social groups of millions. Where did this stuff come from? Uh, I think we get a sense of Alexander's creativity here, too. If you look around the room and you ask yourself the question, who's ovulating today? The answer is we don't know. Um, we're unique in that regard. Were we any one of our close primate relatives, the evidence would be apparent. Um, so why would humans have evolved to be cryptic ab about this bit of information? It all had to fit together. The model uh, that he came up with uh, is uh, got a bit of an awkward titled Ecological Dominance and Social Competition. And uh, I remember sitting at, uh, I think, the little brown jug asking uh, Dick, well, how would you define ecological dominance? And uh, that was the subject, I think, of many cups of coffee back and forth over a, a number of months. But uh, it boiled down to the idea that there's this balance between Darwin's traditional hostile forces of nature, things like predators and climate and food shortages and the like, on the one hand. But then uh, interactions 
with conspecifics, with other members of our species, with other humans. And what Dick argued was that relative balance started out, as with all species, very heavily in favor of the traditional hostile forces of nature. But our hominin relatives became more and more capable of dealing with those kinds of uh, pressures. But at the same time, uh, the importance of group, within group and between group interactions became more and more important uh, to the point eventually where uh, it was the social competition that was the key selective pressure. As he put it, humans uniquely became their own principal hostile force of nature. So if we're now thinking about the directions that evolution is going to take, it involves our interactions with other humans more so than anything else. And uh, that uh, as a consequence of this, uh, we would get um, evolutionary arms races in uh, three important areas, sociality, um, the brain, and information or culture. That uh, these three areas are going to be uh, wrapped up in arms races so that we're um, getting larger, more complex social groups. Uh, we're getting higher intelligence, particularly in regards to uh, social skills and aptitudes. And uh, the information that we have in our brains, culture, if you will, uh, is becoming increasingly important. And uh, I want to elaborate really on these three themes. Um, I think Alexander basically got it right. Uh, but I think there are some aspects of his model that we can push the envelope a little further on. And uh, that's kind of what I view as my goal. Uh, I wish Dick were here um, because I would love to uh, argue with him a bit about some of these uh, points. Um, but to summarize his model, uh, in, in, in effect, it explains the brain and its specializations, or things like language and empathy that are, are about sociality. They're not about getting food or evading a predator. They are explicitly about dealing with other humans. And uh, if you think about the, the really remarkable aspects of the human mind, uh, it is the, the social world that it is particularly gifted at. I will further argue that uh, this explains why we're so creative and can be creative in a lot of domains that seem outside of sociality. I was asked a great question uh, in Beverly's class about 15 minutes ago about engineering, um, which is, you know, uh, was my family's orientation. And uh, without the kind of creativity that social interactions require, um, I don't think we would be such great engineers either. So it's a broad range of intellectual abilities that humans evolved. Our sociality is uh, also unique. Uh, we have very complex coalitions, nested coalitions, uh, interacting coalitions, and particularly in uh, the kinds of small scale societies that our ancestors uh, evolved in, uh, the, the kinds of relationships among families and, and kin relationships are also very important and unusual, very different from those of our closest relatives. And uh, that uh, both of these, the brain and our complex sociality, underpin the development of the flow of information among humans. Uh, an idea can get from one community to another very rapidly. It can go viral. This is not the case for chimpanzees, where ideas are siloed in. We have an unusual sexuality. So Alexander was able to explain things like concealed ovulation and menopause, uh, female orgasm, a host of other characteristics of our sexuality fit with his social competition model. 
Likewise, our unusual life histories, where we spend such a long, long time in childhood, which on the face of it is a really bad evolutionary idea to postpone reproduction. Uh, in general, selection is going to favor uh, reproducing as quickly as you can. And our infants, um, boy, they're lovable. Uh, it's a good thing because uh, they're very helpless. Um, but mentally, they're very precocial. They acquire language uh, and they do a bunch of other stunning uh, intellectual accomplishments. Um, and then post-reproductive uh, periods, uh, including a very clear, specific physiological uh, adaptation, menopause. Uh, again, seems on the face of it to be uh, a bad idea in terms of evolution. Why would you stop having babies when natural selection is all about having more babies and getting your genes into future generations? How could it do a, a better job of that than trying to have another kid? Um, and then, you know, some of our tools, uh, gosh, uh, bows and arrows and spears and all sorts of stuff um, that we use uh, are pretty remarkable and special. So um, yeah, I think Alexander got all this stuff straight. But uh, there are some areas that I think we can push harder on. And uh, partly, I think these were areas that Dick was not uh, especially interested in or didn't see as being as critical to testing his ideas as uh, some other areas were. But um, that just leaves some low-hanging fruit, perhaps, uh, for the rest of us to explore in thinking about uh, how this all works. The who. Um, you know, why humans and not chimps or dolphins or elephants or wasps? Why are we this dominant species on the planet with these enormous brains and these other traits. So we're going to have to come up with a story, an explanation, that is a unique story for our unique trajectory. Um, how? The mechanisms, genetic mechanisms, neurobiology, endocrinology. Um, that left room for uh, students of his, such as myself and Beverly, to work out some of the details of how these systems work. Uh, and uh, I think from that, infer via reverse engineering what the selector pressures were on, on these mechanisms that underpin our abilities uh, in sociality and other areas. And uh, for Anthropologists and archaeologists, in particular paleoanthropologists and archaeologists, the when and where. So when the, we look at the evidence such as it is uh, from the fossil record and archaeological record, and we try and piece together the stages, the steps that our ancestors and ancestresses took to get to where we are today, what were those steps? When concealed ovulation? Um, when a bigger brain? And uh, you know, at, at what points in time? Because the model arguably requires uh, certain things precede others. And so if the archeological or paleoanthropological uh, record is not consistent with that, the model would be falsified. So uh, starting with looking at our closest living relatives, Pan, and that includes both common chimps and uh, bonobos, but I'm going to fo focus first on uh, chimpanzees. <clears throat> we look at their communities. Uh, they're structured quite differently from that of, of humans, uh, small-scale societies. So uh, we would typically have uh, one community over here and then a different community over here, and the relationships between those communities are hostile. You cannot carry a pizza and a six pack of beer next door and uh, hang out together. They're gonna kill you. Um, this is really important, uh, particularly when we think about culture and the flow of information. The flow of information is molasses in the chimpanzee world. Ideas are not moving from one community to the next. They can't. They don't have cell phones. Um, 
and they don't get together to share ideas. We do, and uh, I think it's a reasonable inference that uh, in that very early transitional period after the split from the last common ancestor, uh, maybe eight, seven, six million years ago, um, our ancestors were not like this. Uh, instead, uh, we had a simpler form of what we see in small scale societies today, which is interacting communities that have relatives in other communities who interact. We facilitate the possibility of brothers and sisters having lifelong relationships. That can't happen in chimp land. Um, we have bilateral kinship, where we recognize relatives not just through our mothers and mothers and sisters, uh, but through dads and brothers and uncles. So the human kinship map is bilateral, and the relationships are bilateral, not um, in a, a singular siloed off um, lineage. Um, Affinal relationships, marriage, uh, the links there form connections between groups and communities. All of this potentiates, again, the flow of information. So information can be way more important because it's there for you to take advantage of. So selection for cultural abilities to generate ideas, to recognize a good idea, to analyze uh, information that is coming, to socially learn and transmit information becomes possible and more and more important. So we anthropologists, we love to map this stuff out and there's quite a bit of interesting diversity in kinship systems uh, in humans, but um, those key aspects of bilateral kin recognition, affinal relationships, um, multi-generational relationships. So grandparents are there to learn from. Uh, they can be repositories of valuable information that um, can be disseminated to their kin. Um, right, so I think I can maybe jump right down to the bottom there. I mean, we think about the evolution of language, what, you know, we take it for granted, but what a very special adaptation we have for moving information, for socially transmitting ideas, just remarkable. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not about a stone tool usually, it's about what other people are doing. We gossip. So we are keeping track of the social map and manipulating it in our own best interests. Um, we're creative. The arms races here in sociality and information um, and the brain um, are favoring better and better and better mousetraps because you have to outcompete the current competition, not some static target. Um, so brains are gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, as exemplified by one of my favorite kids, Aisha, um, who's a resident in my village. When she was five, she jumped into second grade and uh, pretty much took over the job of teacher. Um, like most humans, her brain is more than three times bigger than that of our closest relatives, who are arguably really brainy uh, themselves. Um, it's a very costly thing for her to be doing because her brain, uh, ideas are not free. They are metabolically very expensive. At her age, uh, she's using more than 50% of her energy building and running that information processor. So uh, it's a very costly thing to do. It evolved very rapidly. If we look in the fossil record, um, the, 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 the real jumps in cranial capacity happened in the last two million years, a blink of an eye. So the, the selective pressures acting on the brain were very intense. And it's not just a bigger computer, it's a specialized computer and it's specialized in specific ways. Social skills, mental time travel, empathy, theory of mind, language. Uh, these are all social abilities. Brain hormone interactions um, are also very interesting. We've got chemical messengers and the crosstalk but that uh, those messengers' hormones enable 
uh, will be uh, grist for the mill for us to, to try and tease apart how this might have evolved. Um, so this big brain, expensive brain, did it evolve to hunt down the wily mango, which children in my village are wont to do? Um, it doesn't really require a lot of neurons to find a mango for yourself. On the other hand, uh, to keep it for yourself and away from your hungry brother, it might be a different story. Um, Darwin suggested tool use was, was a key thing, and um, it might be in certain regards, but it certainly, um, uh, I don't think this chimpanzee is employing empathy to crack this nut. On the other hand, the complexity of social relationships, the very long childhood that we spend on developing social skills and relationships uh, and uh, trying experimenting, trying out uh, that world. Uh, as Mel Connor put it, uh, humans are the species that raises children. And uh, yeah, I think that's a, a big part of the puzzle there. Uh, as Alison Gopnik and colleagues put it, um, yeah, what we think of as being a, a rather benign little character uh, in fact, is the greatest mind that's ever existed, the most powerful learning machine in the universe. So selection in human evolution resulted in this most powerful learning machine in the universe. Uh, we can think of the family in which the child is raised, in effect, as a nest for the development of this social and cultural mind. Um, there are hormones that facilitate this process of uh, family relationships, and they're quite different than that of our closest relatives. Uh, this chimpanzee uh, arguably is cuter than the picture of the infant who happened to be my first son. Uh, and not that I don't think my son is really, really cute, because um, I do. But uh, were I a chimp dad, um, I would not respond in anywhere near the same way uh, as I do to my own son. Chimps, uh, adult males, are not evolved. They don't have a brain with the receptors that reward that kind of parental behavior, or for that matter, uh, the love that one might have for one's wife. On the other hand, uh, they do have a brain that's pretty good at uh, forming coalitions which is important and interesting. Um, looking at other mechanisms, tools that we have in our uh, research set today, uh, one can do brain imaging to look at what parts of the brain are involved in what kinds of social activities. Uh, when I was here as a postdoc, I really wanted to compare chimpanzees with humans in these regards, with things like sign language and whatnot. But we just couldn't figure out how to get a chimp into an fMRI <laughs> tube, as you might expect. Um, uh, we have interesting patterns of things like hormone uh, levels that uh, exist between mothers and their infants. And there are individual differences. So these are two cases here that uh, show quite different patterns. Uh, in general, um, moms and grandmothers and their offspring and dads are swimming uh, in a sea of oxytocin, this affiliative neuropeptide that facilitates the rewards that we get from those kinds of activities. Uh, grandparents also, uh, you know, I'm really interested in this question is whether or not grandparenting is in effect an adaptation or whether it's just kind of an incidental byproduct of parenting. Uh, but the more grandparents I talk to and Darn it, I'm not yet a grandparent. Um, I still have my hopes up, but um, you know, they, they describe it as a different experience. And uh, tracking uh, hormone levels, uh, we do see uh, certainly an oxytocin response uh, of grandmothers to being with their infants, which is kind of cool. Um, the kinds of stuff that kids are really good at, in this case, uh, they're explaining social relationships amongst children in the entire village, and their memory for such things is phenomenal. Um, here we're looking at uh, a cricket match, and we're monitoring uh, hormone response to winning and losing in these kinds of contexts to examine the kinds of mechanisms that uh, underpin sociality. 
Um, so there's a lot of work to be done on Alexander's model uh, in uh, mechanisms, hormonal, neurobiological, and the like. Uh, there's also uh, quite a bit of work to be done uh, thinking about the specific changes through time uh, in hominin evolution. What happened when and how and why? Um, and how do the environments of selection differ between those uh, of our ancestors and those of our close relatives? So um, I'm going to end on one of Dick's favorite quotes. Um, I think I was a junior in high school and uh, I had met and fallen in love with Richard Alexander's daughter. So I was riding my bike from my house down Warren Road to where uh, the Alexander family lived. And uh, this guy, Robert Bigelow was, was visiting. Um, and he had written a book called The Dawn Warriors. And Dick was really interested in that book. It <coughs> kind of fit in with his ideas about how humans might have evolved. And uh, there's this particular quote, Bigelow had uh, a, a great sense of, oh gosh, you know, irony <laughs> and humor, uh, a hydrogen bomb. And this was kind of apropos for me because my dad was in uh, the Manhattan Project and sometimes around the dinner table we would talk about um, the missile crisis in Cuba and various other things when I was growing up. And um, so we have Bigelow here uh, describing a hydrogen bomb as an example of our capacity for friendly cooperation. Um, okay, <laughs> uh, to, to build it, you, you, you do have to get an unbelievable amount of team management and cooperation to, to put this together, a single-minded devotion toward a common goal. And uh, I mean, Oppenheimer, the, the recent movie, I think kind of captured that reasonably well, uh, that sense of unity uh, but then it broke up when uh, people started to think, oh my God, what have we done, we humans? Uh, why have we gotten to this point in our evolutionary history where we, we've generated the potential to destroy the planet that we evolved on? Uh, and yet uh, Bigelow asks us to pause and savor the glow of self-congratulation we deserve for belonging to such an intelligent and sociable species. Oh my. Um, yeah, I challenge uh, my undergraduates, you know, it's their generation uh, to, to show perhaps uh, what's really required to be an intelligent and social spe sociable species because it's not clear that uh, my generation has done a particularly good job of that. Thank you. You're happy to take questions? I'm more than happy to take questions. I will delight in that. A new piece of the puzzle. So do you think that one of the things Dick used to say was that evolutionary biology and understanding of it could help solve our some of our world problems, whether it's nukes or what's happening ecologically to the planet? We didn't know about global warming back then, really. I mean, I expect, um, so much, or we, a lot of, we weren't thinking about it. They were still, they were already collecting the data. But anyway, um, I kind of um, think not many people have tried to use evolutionary theory for the greater good. So do you think it can be used for the greater good, or that we'll just still all have the same bad genes and fight each other? I mean, it was, uh, well, you're kind of throwing me a softball here of sorts. Um, you know, we can take it in small steps. So, uh, you know, as scientists, I think we try and, and use knowledge, 
such as we might gain from evolutionary biology about ourselves in relatively small scale translational kinds of things. So I'm very interested in how to help children who have experienced traumatic uh, events and to recover from that. And um, I gain insights from thinking about what the mind has evolved to do and what the mechanisms are to solve that kind of small problem. Uh, Bigelow has a big problem here. Um, and uh, you know, as Dick saw, it, um, we are sticking our ostrich heads in the sand. Even though ostriches don't do that, so I shouldn't use it as an analogy. But you know what I mean. Um, we're hiding uh, from the problem. Uh, Dick argued that there's a we're, we're not deliberately, consciously hiding from it, but we are just generally uncomfortable with thinking about ourselves and. An evolutionary way that, uh, in a simplistic sense, it might involve something like, well, we're stuck with this because of our genes, but we're not. You know, if anything that, you know, Alexander's model would suggest to us is that uh, we can be creative and uh, we can be even more creative if we understand what we've evolved uh, to do. And, and you know, understanding how our minds work and how our sociality works will empower us uh, to circumvent the kinds of problems that uh, military arms races, economic arms races, making pollution, um, that uh, the kind of cooperation that we're going to need on a global scale to solve those problems. Um, you know, uh, it's pretty rough because, you know, this is sort of high level stuff thinking about evolutionary biology and getting the entire planet to kind of have a, a common understanding on that basis is not going to be easy, um, that's for sure. Uh, but is that a goal? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Thank you. Uh, runaway selection. Humans. Whenever you ask them about this, the bottom line is the only way out is regulation. Do you have any other options? Regulation. Well, regulate ourselves. Uh, Legally or. Um, well, gosh, you know, we're kind of. We do a lot of that with law and politics and indirect reciprocity reputations. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to just... <laughs> we'll hold you I'm, 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 <laughs> uh, I'm very optimistic, just in general, that's my personality. I'm very optimistic. Um, uh, you mean by regulations sort of uh, forcing people to do things that they are not otherwise choosing to do with free will? Yeah, um, well, gosh, you know, here we are at the University of Michigan. The beacon on the hill, the best university in the world, and the best football team. Yes. Um, can we aspire to moving the cultural information pool in ways? I mean, doesn't education? I mean, I like to think that um, you know, learning about all this has changed my mind about how I would view, for example, a nuclear weapon or use of plastics. Um, I would recognize the difficulties in, in getting as, you know, coming from our competitive background, how, how do we unite all these coalitions in, in a new and different way? Does it take an attack from an alien species to get us to, to unify or you know something along. I mean neuroscience would argue that information alone doesn't necessarily do that much. Um, it is kind of a third rail topic too, like you say, looking in the mirror. What do we see? What about fashion? What if it became fashion not to do something? And if you did that, you wouldn't be selected. Does fashion have that kind of power? Um, I, yes, I think we're very sensitive to fashion. Yeah. So um, arguably, there's an arms race of um, gaining friends. So you know, uh, there's an escalation in niceness. I'm nicer than I was ten years ago. 
Um, and I think I'm learning how to be nicer and nicer and nicer. And I think arguably, at least around me, I'm surrounded by people who are doing the same thing because we're competing for social relationships. And part of the way we do that is by being kind. And maybe you just seem nicer because everybody else is getting nicer. <laughs> I could just simply be delusional in my old age, too. But... Or life is like that. Um, yeah, but fashion uh, is uh, a term, you know, that could include, uh, you know, a, a cluster of memes uh, that spread because uh, we all get reinforced for it. You know, there's uh, appreciation. Your, your reputation matters. And uh, if the fashion results in something that's in the global best interest, <laughs> arguably, you know, I think I see threads of that all the time. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't get selected if you were behaving a certain doing, doing certain things that are destructive. And it depends what, you know, I'm not sure what you mean by selected. Are you talking about natural selection or? More sexual selection. Okay. Yeah, just, you know, people like us and we're socially successful. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's pretty key. I, I always get discouraged when when I hear that the chips are our closest relatives. Do you know what the bonobos <laughs> Can we run that one a bit? Or, or, oh, yeah. What, what, could you compare? Because I don't have a lot of knowledge. I don't trust the knowledge I have about this. Yeah. They seem less patriarchal, less complexity. Um, yeah, they are less violent. Yeah. So the frequency of genocide is, or bonobocide is much lower than in chips. Um, you know, part of that's kind of, well, have we just not seen it yet? But uh, in general, uh, you know, I think that's a reasonable uh, sort of synopsis from the, the primatologists who are really been working on that. Um, I hesitate a minute there because of one of the absolute great primatologists passed away this week, um, Franz de Waal. Um, and he was someone who was really gifted at understanding the mind of the chimpanzee and the bonobo and their morality, um, you know, in ways that the rest of us just, you know, we're not as skilled at. But yeah, bonobos, I think arguably one could potentially evolve a hominin from a bonobo, but it's very difficult to see how you could get there from a chimp. Chimps are stuck in a rut, whereas bonobos have more flexibility in their relationships with others. The potential for culture and information flow to become more important is there, but uh, they don't have the bilateral kinship. They don't have multi-generational stuff. Um, so, you know, they've got some big handicaps. So the Planet of the Apes, um, boy, it's, it's, it's tough to get there from our current choices. And that would include Vonnegut's dolphins uh, and the tooth whales. Yeah, this is um, Very uh, thought provoking and uh, very interesting. Uh, I don't know if What's the current thinking about the sequencing evolutionarily of some of these adaptations, you know, to use upright, big brains, childhood, good civilization, which came first? Well, uh, starting with my anthropology uh, side of my degree here at the University of Michigan, um, we learned that bicodality was the key initial hominid step. I think that still holds today. Uh, part of the question is, what was that last common ancestor like in terms of its locomotion abilities? But I think the guess is that initial trajectory into more terrestrial niche would favor a increasing efficiency of bipedal locomotion and carrying. And that is going to generate different kinds of sociality, a defense against predators, would be different from the line that Pan took. Um, so, you know, that's a, a step. It's not a big step in, in what Dick was trying to explain, Alexander was trying to explain. But I think arguably it sets the, the precedent.
for interaction among communities and uh, eventually selection for male parental care, um, which would be important to grandmothers and the like. Um, it's, you can't get male parental care if you advertise ovulation. So you're going to have to co evolve concealed ovulation and male parental care and by lateral kinship. So those are subsequent steps. Um, the coalition building that happens in the, the complexity of uh, sociality. Um, it's just going to build. Um, and it would likely be diverse because environments are not uniform. There would be some areas that our hominid ancestors were residing in uh, that might have been in a relatively rich areas that you would want to be in. Competition might be more intense there than, say, in more marginal habitats. The pace of evolutionary change might have been more rapid in those areas as well. Um, well we need archaeologists to, 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 to really kind of take this model to heart. Uh, there's a paper recently published with archaeologists and some other folks. Um, I don't know how you, you put up a, a bibliography or a reading list after your talks that people can see. You're welcome to send references to share. Yeah, PDFs. Yeah. yeah. So Townsend et al. in uh, the Proceedings of the Royal Society uh, last year, 23. We go through the stages. I have a related question. You've obviously thought about this a lot. When do you think concealed ovulation evolved? Like, were we, were we homo erectus or what were we? And the same question for menopause. Could you talk? Yeah, well, I've got speculations. Well, that'd be good. Yeah, um, I'll take the menopause one first. Okay. Uh, and the contrast with chimps, I think, is pretty important. So, uh, George Williams uh, came up with an idea that uh, menopause might make sense if parental care was really important over a long period of time, such that the trade off between a mother trying to have another child and the cost that that would impose on her mortality. Um, you know, myself, I can't imagine giving birth at my age. Uh, you know, I'm getting decrepit. You know, I can't run a six minute mile anymore. So uh, instead, uh, I'm not having any more babies. Uh, and I'm taking care of the ones that I have and helping them to survive and reproduce. So that was the, the gist of his argument for why menopause could evolve. You get more of your genes into future generations by focusing on the kids you already have rather than the normal avenue of trying to, uh, and it works. There's kind of a cool paper that just came out uh, on toothed whales that are uh, probably the best other example of species that have menopause. Uh, chimps, a uh, recent paper came out arguing that chimpanzees have some of the physiology. Um, and it can work for focusing on kids you've already had. If you die and your, your orphan kids aren't going to reproduce, then you don't want to do risky stuff like having another kid. So I, th I think that works for chimps and maybe a few other species. Uh, but an added benefit uh, in humans and toothed whales, uh, and perhaps elephants, uh, is that given our life histories, we have these really long lifetimes, and we can do something besides just help our kids survive. Um, we're living long enough to help our kids' kids survive. We can be grandparents. In fact, the house, uh, one of the houses I lived in, had a great great grandmother. A great great grandmother. I mean, what a phenomenal overlap of generations. Um, that we humans are capable of. Uh, and, uh, you know, there have been different studies, including some by yourself, about, well, do grandparents actually enhance the survival of their kids? And I would say that it depends on the context. And there may be more to it than just um, measuring survival, uh, that information flow potential uh, that we delude ourselves, I think, as we get older, that we get wise and are smarter than we were when we were younger, which of course is not the case, but uh, we do accumulate a lot of information. And we do feel very comfortable dispensing it to our offspring and other youth. 
whether they take it or not is another issue. But um, so that was menopause, and you asked about okay, so when the timing of it. Well, arguably, uh, with Australopithecines, uh, the babies are getting heavier. Arguably, more altrician. So, if you have a heavier, more altrician baby that needs more parental care, this has also been an argument not just for mothers and menopause living longer, but also for allopro care, either from dads or aunts or grandmothers, other kin. Um, I, I think it started there. So, you know, you want my bet on, you know, when we're going to find the first fossilized menopause? <laughs> Not going to work. Um, uh, I, I would say Australopithecines, probably later, starting in that transition. So, two and a half million years ago. Do they have a lot of sexual dimorphism, though? They do. Maybe not so much paternal care, so wouldn't it we can't, have to We can't them? rule out paternal care from uh, sexual dimorphism. So it, it may, uh, the sexual dimorphism that was previously there um, might not uh, have, it might have other consequences than males competing against one another that was causing uh, the dimorphism. And they are terrestrial, so you know, there's more going on there to body size. Um, but yes, that's a good argument. Uh, Lovejoy would argue, of course, that they're not as diamorphic and they're diminishing. But certainly females get bigger when we look at the late Australopithecines or early Erectus ergaster. So males, you know, are staying in that 120 pound, five foot six range, but females go from being four and a half feet to being more than five feet and over 100 pounds. Chimps are not that diamorphic. <laughs> Um, the other thing about Australopithecines is the canine dimorphism is gone. So that would suggest, you're, at a minimum, you're not fighting with your teeth anymore. Why would you give up those canines? Um, it's a good question. Is that sort of the, the view in concealed anthropology, or, or do those guys not think about They don't think about menopause or concealed ovulation, not that I'm aware of. Um, gosh. I mean, Milford retired. <laughs> He's not here to ask. I'm not sure who I would run to the, to, to ask about that one. Concealed ovulation. That's Carol, yeah, we could, yeah, she, yeah, she would be ideal to ask, actually. I'll pose that question to her. When did uh, concealed ovulation? Yeah. Well, the other thing to worry about is sort of the spatial distribution. So if you're going out there and you're being terrestrial and like these extended family units, then you don't have to worry about the problem of males. Um, you're A, not going to get other males to compete over you. So the advantage to a female of advertising estrus to her ovulation to, to get male-male competition is, is diminishing pretty quickly there with the Australopithecines, pre-Australopithecines. So um, uh, arguably, uh, estrus songs would diminish very early. But to push them into the state we are now, which is a remarkable level of concealment, um, that's probably a, a little more recent, obviously. And I don't think it's doing this. Early erectus. Because you're not going to be able to get serious male parental care and bilateral kinship with that. It's absolutely fundamental. Yeah. I have two questions. One of them is Does sociality in animals and humans lead to more conflict from murder within the species in addition to more cooperation? Oh gosh, more sociality. Does it lead to more competition, which leads to more violent conflict? Um, that's a hard question. I, you know, I'd say not necessarily. So there's not a clear link amongst those things. So um, Alexander, um, I think, had struggled with how do you support the argument of becoming more pro-social 
to be more antisocial. So we're going to become really good friends so that we can attack Max. <laughs> you know, what's the logic of that one? Um, so, yeah, it's tough. Uh, we humans do kill each other you know, at remarkable levels, and in some cases in small-scale societies, but there's a lot of variability there, too. So, um, you know, there isn't a simple pattern of data there. Second question. Second question. You had a quote that humans are our own hostile force. Can you just say more about that? How that plays out. Yeah, so Alexander, uh, in trying to figure out what was unique and special about human evolution, uh, suggested that, that the relative importance of interacting with other humans as a selective pressure, whether we survive and reproduce or not, is more contingent on our relationships with other humans. That could be coalitions, it could be family, it, you know, any kind of interhuman support um, and conflict, that we become our own most important selective pressure. Our, so he's using principal hostile force of nature as you know, kind of Darwin's phrase, because Darwin talked about the hostile forces of nature. And Alexander is using that you know, kind of as, and we're saying two things about that. One, the importance of those things, climate, you know, I got a really nice jacket that I brought with me thinking it was going to be Ann Arbor and cold and gray and rainy. Um, so our, our hominid ancestors developed the abilities to, to deal with those problems. Uh, they could keep themselves warm. They could shelter themselves from the rain. They could protect themselves from predators. Um, the one that's a little dicey because it interacts with uh, demography epidemiology are selective pressures from pathogens because as population levels build up and interactions among humans builds up then you're going to have more disease transmission so that's the trickier one but uh, one that we can't really defeat with our brains either I think so uh, uh, but yeah humans become their most important selective pressure is it too soon to know how that would affect our future evolution? Yes. <laughs> Unless we take control of things. You know, it doesn't, you know, pollution and atomic weapons and all these things that are, I think, predictably coming out of this process of social competition. Um, can we get our act together to collaborate uh, in a way that we've never really done before at a global scale? Because it's been this team against this team, this coalition. I gotta ask, did Michigan beat Michigan State last night? <laughs> yes! <laughs> Sorry. I, I didn't want to be doing this as a career. I wanted to be a hockey player. I grew up skating on Barton Pond. No way. Oh man, I wanted to be on a Michigan Wolverine hockey player. So bad. Alas. <laughs> I, was, I was too young. So I, you know, I was like always two years younger than all the other players in high school. Did you skip grades? Yeah, I skipped grades, so it didn't fare well for competitive sports. But I tried really hard, <laughs> and I still have all my teeth, although they're chipped. Yeah, Max. Um. So in the context of social competition, Alexander also like. Especially emphasizing group versus group competition he does. of all sizes. Yeah. But does it, like, with them or say what they're competing against? Each other. Or why are they like, competing? Um, you know, that's where Shagnon, I think, helps us a bit. Um, and you know, look at the Yanomamo. Um, the, the complexity of their society and building alliances and coalitions and his focus on fissioning and the history of Yanomamo villages through time. Um, you know, when do they split? When do they fuse? And uh, the context is invariably, it's not about gardens or, you know, that stuff. It's about other Yanomamo villages raiding. You know, do you have enough raiders or enough able-bodied warriors to protect yourselves from your enemies? 
And the enemies are constantly changing. It's a very dynamic situation where alliances are being made and broken. And yet you know, everybody's competing over, as Shagnon's informant, River Bawa, put it, um, when trying to solve the debate between the great Marvin Harris and the upstart Napoleon Shagnon, uh, why are the Atamalos so violent? What are they fighting over? Ray Ravawa said, um, well, Nat, we do like meat, but we like women a whole lot more. And you know, the key reproductive resource there uh, arguably uh, involved uh, competition over women. At least that was Shagnon's, I think, main argument. The extent to which you know, we could take a uh, you know, a society that has horticulture and you know, all the stuff that Yanomamo do and apply it um, to earlier stages uh, in human evolution is very speculative. But um, the fact that groups like the Yanomamo develop the kinds of kinship and marriage exchange systems and rules about kin terminology and alliances and coalitions definitely fits in with you know, this kind of idea. Um, so, uh, you know, the, 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 I guess the general answer would be in terms of what are you fighting over, it's whatever is worth fighting over. Um, and it is a little tough because there are a lot of times where when we look and listen to our ethnographic informants, they're not telling us, uh, you know, really what they're fighting over. They're fighting over the fact that those guys killed one of us. So it seems much more um, uh, so Yeah, I guess I mean, I guess I meant like more initially when we hear a lot of people down there. Oh, yeah. yeah. What the f first things that would that cause to start to cause which seems like. Yeah, well, look at chimps. I mean, chimps are in conflict, and arguably. They're in conflict over space. Um, that gets a little tricky. Uh, you know, I would say the vast majority of from band level societies, at least contemporary band level societies, are not fighting over space. Um, you know, but they're living in areas in which there's a lot of space, unless they're getting screwed over by uh, you know outside forces, colonialism, basically. Um, so to imagine, you know, back in early human history, what, what was involved there, um, my guess is not a whole lot uh, for at least that first five million years after the last common ancestor. Um, I'm not seeing that there's a lot of fight over it. Um, it's when we get even more ecologically dominant, and you can see that with the spread, for example, of very early Homo out of Africa, and the continued um, uh, Africa being the hotbed of evolution. So you know the the more modern variants seem to continually be coming out of Africa. So you know what was going on in that continent was like the uh, the, it was where it was happening, um, and what they were fighting over, if they were fighting, uh, is, gosh, you know, I don't know, sitting there on lakes on the Lake Turkana, <laughs> um, probably a better place than you know being out there by Lamar and you know, out in the middle of nowhere with nothing. So certainly there would have been areas that were more amenable to human habitation, better places to live. So you'd probably be competing with other groups to be occupying those kinds of resources. When we start competing over social resources, things like um, marriage exchange, um, boy, that's a tough one. You know, when was the first marriage arranged? And ships don't arrange marriages. Are there any species that arrange marriages besides humans? Why? I don't think so. Because we take it very seriously in some contexts, because the consequences are huge for the coalitions. And we're the only species that has that kind of aphanal link, which then makes the connections among groups so much more important and salient and 
much more amenable to the flow of culture. So those, those kinship ties, bilateral and ethanol, are, are really important. Yeah. So uh, you're talking about how humans have a slew of unique traits, like concealed ovulation, fertility. Yeah, the tables we put together, some of them get close to 100 traits. So I was wondering, what's um, the link between, say, paternal care and concealed ovulation? Because you think paternal care would be enabled by higher levels of paternity certainty. Yes. But one of the leading hypotheses for concealed ovulation is that it confuses paternity. Yeah, Sarah's wrong. Sarah already, she's wrong. She argues that concealed ovulation serves an anti-infanticidal thing because it confuses who's dad. Um, I just think she's flat out wrong because uh, if you look at species that have, well, gosh, I don't know. She would, she, I need, she would need to be here to defend her argument. But um, the species that have high levels of male parental care, pretty much across the mammals or even outside of mammals, um, have a situation in which males are very clearly able to identify who their offspring are, either consciously, cognitively, or just you know, in the context of you know, spatially, they're together. And so selection can favor males doing things that are not, that are costly to their genotype, that help the, their putative offspring. Okay, so um, I would say that um, Alexander's argument, and more specifically uh, Dr. Strassman's argument about concealed ovulation being linked to male parental care, are the ones that uh, I would buy into. So I kind of shut that part of your question. Pardon? How do you explain concealed ovulation to the parental care? Um, that it was in a woman's best interest, uh, step by small, step by step, because that's the way evolution proceeds. You can't do it in a hopeful monster. You, you got to explain why each little tiny movement in the direction is going to be better than what the existing model is. Um, the less and less you attract outside male attention, the more uh, possible it is for uh, a male partner that you do have oh. to not uh, get displaced. And part of the argument was whether or not this works for um, the, the, in the best interests of the, the more dominant males in the group or not so dominant males in the group. And Beverly's argument that uh, it's the not so dominant males, um, I think has held uh, sway over Alexander and Newton's initial suggestions. Is that the main impact of concealed ovulation? You know, that's a, that's a great point. So the other advantage that uh, Alexander argues for, and I'd have to, you'd have to ask Beverly uh, to what extent this is part of her model, uh, is that it diminishes conflict within a group. So you're going to be a more competitive group because you get along better. We're not duking it out over estrous females. Um, Could it give the female more power to choose? That's another argument. Um, and the problem with that one is how does the choice work? Because um, the, the, it can work beautifully well if a woman knew herself when she was ovulating. So one of the arguments uh, is, is just that, that the women uh, evolved concealed ovulation to basically have their cake and eat it too. They get some guy to hang around and help them and take care of the kid, but then when they're ovulated, they sneak out and get great genes from you know, a dominant male. And uh, I don't know if Beverly remembers this, but we were in a HBS conference where one of our colleagues put that model up there. And I think Beverly kind of gave me an elbow or two saying, come on, and you, you got to ask the question. And so I asked the question, and it was a nice, beautifully big lecture hall with hundreds of ardent human behavior and evolution people. And uh, the question was, Steve, um, can any, can, is it possible to point out any woman in this audience who's ovulating today? And, you know, well, of course you couldn't <laughs> because ovulation was concealed. 
Um, and you know, the, the, the question one might also ask is, you know, who in the audience is aware that they're ovulating today? And unless you have very specific kinds of medical knowledge, you're not going to know. So, you know, the possibility that an australopithecine female or, you know, homo erectus, whatever we know, uh, that she's ovulated, so she counted the days or had a thermometer. Or so it could be designed to choose. Yes, it could be behaviorally. But yes, <laughs> you're not getting the winner of the male male competition. Not immediately. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And actually, that's a great question is whether or not you can get more benefit out of female choice that way than uh, the, the male competition way. I don't know if I've thought about that one. That's a you got any thoughts on that, Beverly? So you're asking <clears throat> if females conceal ovulation so that they could disenfranchise the males who are otherwise basically coerce them into mating so that then they could pick and choose who they wanted to mate with, is what you're asking. I don't know if it sounds like that's a conscious thing, but I think give them more time to. Would to certainly facilitate well, your I, idea. I, I, and here's why I think that that's not how it works, is because with menstrual taboos, that's sort of like an anti-concealment of ovulation tactic, culturally that exists, menstrual taboos are always imposed on women by men in every society where they occur. So I, I don't believe that's how it works. I think it's an interesting idea, though. But yeah, men definitely, dominant men, powerful men, it's in their best interest to control female sexuality. So things like female genital mutilation and, and yeah, a whole host of ways of restricting female sexuality are generally imposed by powerful, wealthy men in cultures in which you have powerful, wealthy men. You don't see them in band level egalitarian societies. So the males would have to expend less energy or, or less creative energy. Well, whatever females are interested in, they're interested in good parents. I think that if a female displayed her ovulation, then males would come mate with her, and it would really work against getting male paternal care. Or male care. original idea. And so I think that's kind of all we need. I see. But I see males competing with women. We ended up having less males. And then because of the competition, it created males. The males in the Wasn't there a Germany scientist to show that uh, girls who are ovulating were more likely to take their clothes off and go dancing? There's hundreds of those. They were not, you know, they, uh, on self report, they wouldn't say, that I'm ovulating. I mean, they had no idea what they were. That's what status was, but, 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 but they didn't know that they had a sub to get naked and be where lots of men were. No, I, I can answer this. There's, okay. There's a slight um, increase in what you call proceptivity. Yeah. Okay. In, in the middle of the sex. Okay. But it's a small increase. It's nothing like estrus or enlarged mm -hmm. uh, rear ends or anything like that. But that. The, the findings that there were slight increases, or that a little bit of estrogen could uh, increase uh, proceptivity or attractivity, mm -hmm. not really receptivity. You know, if you look at those three aspects of it. Uh, so but, but, a no, but the but the but the the fact that that existed and kind of became known thirty years ago just Mushroom into this whole <laughs> I'm saying craziness. expanse of research where basically people just got ahead of their skis on this and yeah. just made too much out of it, which tends to happen. There's a little bit of a finding and then it just gets wildly extrapolated. Yeah. Laura, I critique that whole business. What's that? I critique that whole business. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That summarizes that literature. Okay. And there was also a bit of a peak before the men's seats as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Liz, what do yeah. you think about those things? It's like androgen relatives or other things, other hormones, I think, is responsible it's for that. The, the adaptationist in me is always questioning why selection would 
you know, had those hormonal sensitivities if there wasn't a reason for them. But you know, I'm well, I you know, my skis are so <laughs> <laughs> the other, the other thing to remember is that people in, it's only in modern societies that we have menstrual cycles. Yes, 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 absolutely. Yes. absolutely. Being pregnant, or yes. lactating, or yeah. whatever. It just wasn't yeah. much for, for the milk fruit selection to be working on in our past. Yeah, yeah totally agree with that one. Beverly, you would know, in natural fertility societies, how many times is a woman cycle? In her life, yeah. about 100. This, this thing you guys were just discussing cool. is in that paper. I think yeah. I published that in the Alec in the Summers Press the oh, and yeah. the, the okay. Human Social Evolution yeah. 2013. Okay. It's in that one. Okay. The critique of the whole humans have estrus after all, and women know when they're ovulating and all that stuff. Yeah. It's a whole new and yeah. concealed ovulation and why it evolved. Yeah, they like to smell t-shirts of dominant males more when they're on that. Come on. <laughs> really? <laughs> it was not good science. I mean, but I think our whole field has a tendency, frankly, to devolve into rather rather science. I think that in different directions, and you and I were talking about the dual inheritance theory, and and then there's some of the evolutionary psychology with the with the thing Liz just was alluding to, the thing that mushroomed. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's disconcerting because it's I'm not really feeling a ton of evidence that our branch of science, which is evolution and human behavior, is as self-correcting and forward progressing as it really needs to. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if somebody needs to figure out why that is. I, I think it's well, the physics, the experiment just didn't put hypotheses aside. It's too hard to run experiments to test it. But I mean, I think there's good research out there too. I yeah, just, I we can do reverse engineering and various other, uh, you yeah. know, we collect biomarkers. <laughs> <laughs> Not that that's great I science know, either. I feel but... badly that I can't even talk about hormones. Yeah. <laughs> I can't say you can talk about hormones, and I said no. <laughs> that was probably not wise. Oh, no, gosh. I was listening to what you had to say on the other topics, but now I see I didn't get to hear what you have to say about hormones. Oh, it's time to invite me back. <laughs> okay. We'll have a nice hormone uh, conference here. So lots of great people in that area. And I'm totally thrilled because the engineer side, because my family's all engineers, and I sort of just have a geeky interest in tools. Uh, there's going to be uh, these new wearables that can monitor your hormone levels from your sweat every second, 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 second. What's your cortisol? What's your testosterone level? What's your oxytocin level? And the kinds of questions we ask that are generated by these kinds of evolutionary models, you know, I've collected tens of thousands of saliva samples that I monitor children's and their parents' hormone levels and immune function and whatnot. It's just not good enough. It is not nearly good enough to get samples like every hour. So for us to be able to get samples every second in the context of I don't know, it'll be, the ethics are really troubling me. Um, so I'm not quite sure how that part of it's going to work out, but, you know, basically following uh, individuals around in their everyday lives to see how all these chemical messengers and some of the neural stuff is working. Uh, it's going to be uh, a lot more information to test beautiful hypotheses with, that's for sure. Thinking about the evolution of arranged marriage, yeah, and um, and and also on the women's choice to get pregnant with, um, I'm still hoping that there's the point is how much it's unconscious. So I'm thinking of just what I've seen people do. I've met women whose fathers um, uh, kept inviting boyfriend <laughs> over. Even though 
the girl said, I don't want to see him anymore, right? And then I found, too, that I was uh, interfering or not, depending on how much I like the guy, you know? So I was thinking with my daughter, right? And yeah. so I'm thinking um, there was a lot that came before arranged marriages oh, that sure. have been um, not consciously, I'm going to control who my child gets pregnant with, right? And and then, and so it wouldn't surprise me if there's something also with ovulation that women would do that would make it more likely, but you know, I don't know what the mechanism would be. Right. Um, but I can see what mechanisms would certainly have a lot to do with uh, I mean, who your children are meeting. I will just say real briefly yeah. that it's very important for women to get the secure paternal care. Yeah. Our so these fancy strategies where you get, like Mark was saying, where you get your genes in one place and your paternal care in another Not place, work. just way too risky. Yeah. And, you know, very costly. It's the cats way. versus dads thing that's been said. Uh, right. It's not about cats versus dads. It's about a woman needs to package yeah. the source of the DNA that fathers her child yeah. and the source of the paternal care together yeah. as best she can, yeah. even if she can't optimize both, but to make a package deal with that. All right, so the mechanisms of that have, would have to do with how much how selective women are about who they have sex with, and that matters so much. Right? That if you don't like the guy, you're not in it. Yeah, if the relationship is what's, then yeah. you would expect the sexual yeah. attractivity to be wrapped up in that to some extent. Yeah. I'd say that's. I'd say there's a fair bit of variability yeah. there. Yeah, that's fixed. Yeah. So, you know, there are some contexts, uh, some cultures in which that might be more important than others, for some individual women for whom that might be more important. Mm -hmm. Isn't paternity misassigned about 10% of the time? I'm sorry? Isn't paternity misassigned no. about 10% of the time? No. I've, 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 it's it's, it's, I've seen that figure before. That's, that's bogus, okay? okay? That's been disproven by a bunch of people. Okay, well, what's your percentage? It's 2%. Oh, and that's, that's actually high. That includes Depends what culture you're looking at. In the Dolan, it's 1.8%. Yeah. In like Americans and Europeans, it's maximum about 2%-ish. Two, two yes, there was a study in Namibia by Bruce uh, Brooke Skelza where it was like 8 or 10%. Mm -hmm. But oh, I'm yeah, sure that was urban legend that 10% is going to be about for, for a long yeah. time. Yeah. It is really low. Yeah, 2% is very low, but 10% is. Yeah, that, but that was long. That's rare. That's. Well, and we can arguably explain why it would be more important in some contexts than others. So sure. the importance of the relationship, a um, host of other social factors that sure. might. Depends on what daddy has, Bob. Yeah, and then when you get into hormones and life history and so on, yeah. it probably has. This may be more of a current issue than a couple of years right. before. So what about the increase in female education status and its effect on what you were just talking about? This much? Well, there's some known evidence that education in women is leading to lower birth weights, rates in educated women. And there's some evidence by People like Rosemary Topcroft and others, that there's negative selection for intelligence in women in modern societies. And, and, but it doesn't work that way for men because there's less of a trade off between career and reproduction in men. We would say, if I say anything wrong, I'm just correct it. <laughs> I was, I'm just going to comment for what one of you guys said over there. I think you said this too, but like, if a woman knows when she's ovulating, it would be much harder for her to conceal it to a potential. A very good point. Yeah. That Alexander made that point. That. Yeah. And think of the, oh, the, you know, the trust dynamic being a husband and wife. The wife knows when she's ovulating. <laughs> you know, that really kind of throws. A complexity into that relationship. I mean, a woman knows when she's menstruating. 
it's very important reproductive information. When a woman is in postpartum amenorrhea and doesn't undulate and menstruate, then she finally resumes and has a period. And males and societies all around the world have wrested control of that information from the female. That's what menstrual taboos are all about. So that's just building up what Max said. Well, speaking of that, you know, like the sweating t shirt experiment? Right. Do you? Um, like, think there's actually like significant data there, or do you think it's like not good data? Ask Mark. He'll do more with hormones than I do. What do you think? Mark? Well, what's the question? Well, basically, we're a fan. Oh, well, we're these sweaty T-shirt studies. No, those are about, more about pheromones. <laughs> but like, where the men could like pick up on pheromones and tell if the females are. Oh, definitely not. Oh, so yeah. you think it's like completely bogus? Like yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. If it's all about t-shirts, it's probably you know, t-shirts bogus. Yeah, you know, uh, it it would not surprise me or anything falsify the law if there were certain conditions under which uh, the human male female relationship in which there is great intimacy. I'll just leave it there. Our undergraduates amongst us. <laughs> um, uh, might have. You know, some information transmission about ovulation. But, you know, if you think about it, uh, it would probably require sampling to think about changes. And, and uh, the only individual who would be privy to that kind of knowledge would be uh, a partner who you were involved in a very exclusive, very intimate relationship with. So it's an if, in effect still concealed, at least from everybody else. Sure. And it doesn't matter if you're having sex with that partner anyway. Right. I mean, if it's some reasonable frequency. Anybody else? Question? Well, you have created a great discussion. It is now 3 30, which is the official ending time. So I think you're reading Stephanie Preston. I don't know if it's here or it must be upstairs. You know, actually. I think someone outside there. Pardon? I think I can ask. Was it Stephanie Preston? I don't know. Yeah. Well, thank you all for uh, being back here in Anchor. All these just amazing, brilliant minds, students, and faculty alike. Jean.